so we've got a talk by uh, Janet, and she's going to tell us how to reject the evidence of our eyes and ears, which should be interesting. So the stage is yours, and yeah, we'll catch up after. Fantastic. Um, thank you, everyone. Hope you are all refreshed from lunch. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit about deep fakes, um, what the problem with them is, how to create one, and how you can detect them. So by the end of this talk, you will all be able to go away and create your own in a very short space of time. There are quite a few links on my slides. Do feel free to take photos. I will be putting them online afterwards if you don't want to take photos, um, but they are up there. Um, there's a lot of things that you might want to take notes of, but uh, let's jump in. So, um, Orwellian and deep fakes. It's one of my favorite quotes, and uh, further on he goes on to say, if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party line, controls the future. And who controls the present, controls the past. So the dystopia that George Orwell imagined when he was writing 1984 in the first half of the 20th century is not actually that far away, which is quite scary for a lot of people. There is too much to consume. There is too much information out there. We already see people in their own little bubbles of information. And we're all doing it. We read the same newspapers. We watch the same news channels. We read the same websites. We are reinforcing our own worldview based on what we believe to be a trusted source of information. And we bias ourselves by the information we accept. I was having a really interesting conversation over lunch with some of the other speakers, and even I was pulled up on this. This is a list of all of your biases. I appreciate it's a little bit too small to read. Um, there's a lot on there. Um, please do go to the website. I have a copy of this in my office. Um, I think everyone should read it and understand it. The big four are what causes us to have problems. So we need to act fast. We make decisions quickly. Um, Andy, in his keynote this morning, was talking about thinking fast and slow. When we think fast, we miss information and we make generalizations. What should we remember? We don't always remember all the information given to us. Quite often, we compartmentalize and only remember what's important. We have too much information. Again, we filter out looking for patterns. Um, there's some great research that medical doctors, when given a whole array of diagnostic symptoms, will look at five to make their diagnostics. And it's not necessarily the same five for each doctor, but they don't look at 100, they'll look at five. And then finally, not enough meaning. We extrapolate from our own experiences. We assume that other people have the same view and experience of the world that we do, and we make assumptions because of that. This is what makes us susceptible to propaganda and fake news and everything else. And the people that are creating this stuff know this about us and know how to tune information so it makes us emotive and makes us believe it and makes us share it. And when we get a story that fits our version of the truth, something we already believe, we accept it with far less criticism than if someone tells us something that's against our current view of the world. It used to be that if someone said something, we might not believe them. But if we saw a video of it, we'd assume it was true. This is no longer the case. You need to be critical of what you see and hear. You need to deny the evidence of your eyes and ears. So, a hot topic has already been mentioned in a few talks with Brexit. Um, being based in London, there are a lot of people who are protesting on a daily basis that I have to walk past. And because I wanted to expand my worldview, I talked to a few of the Remain protesters. What would it take them to change their vote if there was a second referendum, given everything that's already out there, all of this information that we know about the campaigns that were run last time, everything that's come to light since? 
And the only thing that they, could, they had consensus on that would make them change their vote was if the EU had been directly responsible for war, terrorism, atrocities or famine. So I took a step back and thought, well, these are two things I found online. It's the EU policy for overseas aid and criticism of that as to how it might starve African farmers. It would be trivial, not necessarily easy, but straightforward for someone with my skill set to take existing video of the EU Commission, not the Parliament, but the, the Commission, debating some of these, change a little bit of the audio, change what was going on. I might need a few actors to step in to help me out, but change it so that we can make it look that the majority of the EU didn't care about Africa, and the UK representative was saying, yes, we will give aid regardless. That might be enough to switch people's votes. And this could be created right now, not with the budget of a film studio and months of time, but by one person with a mid-range laptop in the bedroom over a weekend. And that's something I really want to sink in. This is happening. Now, fakes are nothing new. So from the Cottingley Fairies that we've got there, which was just paper cutouts in front of a camera, but nobody had ever done that before. No one had thought about it. And for a long time, a lot of people believed these. And then through to some of my favorite examples from the movies. So you've got, let's try and get them in chronological order. So Being John Malkovich, which is a complete crazy film, if you've not seen it, where he goes into his own mind and everyone has his own face on. Um, Forrest Gump, where they've used existing footage of meeting Kennedy, and they used a stand-in actor, they used an impressionist, and they painstakingly manipulated frame by frame and reanimated it to make it look right. And it still looks a little bit rough, but it took a lot of effort. And then to Rogue One, where so even though Carrie Fisher was still alive, they used a look-alike actress and mapped um, footage from one of the earlier Star Wars films onto her face. And for Tarkov, because the actor was dead, they had to completely re regenerate it. And it got a lot of criticism at the time for these puppet-like things, but this is three years ago. Technology has moved on very quickly. And with AI, it's now really easy. And I just want to underline how quickly this is moving. I agreed to give this talk about four months ago. I have had to rewrite it three times because new things kept coming out, new software, new examples. And even last week, um, the Zeo app, I'm told I'm pronouncing that correctly, with just one single picture, you can put a face into pre-picked segments of uh, movie footage. So, for example, there's a whole host of Leonardo DiCaprio that you can put your face on. There's Kate Winslet. There's various K-pop videos. And it's just from a single front face shot. And it's not perfect, but it's really good from one single picture. That was last week. Um, and there are three examples there. So, firstly... Um, Philip DeFranco's Rogue Rocket did a wonderful deep dive on the history of deep fakes, and they go into a lot more detail than I can go into today on how, they, um, how they're being used at the moment, although they don't talk about how to create one. And then there's two really good examples. So uh, Control Shift Face has put Sylvester Stallone in Terminator 2. It's really freaky to watch, but it works. And one of the most seamless ones I've seen is um, Bill Hader, and he's doing an impersonation of Tom Cruise. And his face very subtly morphs when he's doing the impersonation. And at first you're watching it and you're thinking, oh, he's just got one of those faces that is quite expressive and can change. And then you really look and you go, no, that's Tom Cruise's face. And then it seamlessly shifts back. It's really, really freaky how easy these things are to make. So, I'm going to talk you through the technology of how to do this. But, knowledge is power, and with great power comes great responsibility. And although I genuinely believe that I'm in a room full of very intelligent, good-minded individuals, 
I am not going to show you all of the techniques to make a really movie perfect one. I'm going to show you how to use the default stuff out of the box to make something fun you can impress your friends with. Mainly because as you go through the process of learning how to make things better, I want you to think about why you're doing it and hopefully your own morals will kick in at that point. And for these reasons, you should never create this without consent. There are a lot of amazing, wonderful ethical uses for this, from the entertainment industry to education. You may have seen the video of um, David Beckham speaking seven languages seamlessly. The education potential for this is amazing. However, it is already being used for porn. It's rule 34, maybe. Um, it's out there, it's being used, there are apps that are being taken down because they're doing things that they really shouldn't because it is so easy to do. So please do bear this in mind. So now for the juicy bit, how do you actually create a deepfake? This, this is really easy. So you take a source data set, you need to work out what is the face that you want to replace and you need a destination face. You work out all the features of both of those faces. You create an AI that can convert face A to face B and face B to face A. You find a video that you want to replace. Run it through the model you created in the second step. Update the audio, stitch it all together, and you're done. Okay, just stop there, that's enough to get you know. But no, I'm gonna go into the detail of it. So we're gonna go into every single one of these steps in detail. And we're going to look at the amount of time it takes. Now, all of this was done on a Dell XPS computer with a 1050 NVIDIA card, which is a four gig card. Not top of the range by any means. It's my work computer. It's a bit of a workhorse, but it's say, a 1,500 pound laptop. Same sort of spec in a desktop, around about 1,000 pounds. It is not expensive to do this. So to go with my ethics, I'm not going to create a deep fake of anyone else other than me, because I can give myself permission to do that. Now, in a strong tradition of me making quite off the wall comments in, um, in talks that tend to come true, I've never been to space. If the ESA would like a computer scientist and biochemist to go up to the ISS, I am available. <laughs> However, on the assumption that they don't want um, a middle-aged woman with no military training. Let's fake it. So this is the amazing Samantha Cristo Ferretti. She went up to the ISS towards the end of 2014 into, I think, June 2015. It was expeditions 42 and 43. She became internet famous. I mean, not quite as famous as uh, Chris Hadfield because she took the Star Trek spacesuit up. And... I think she was the first person in space to drink an espresso and lots of other cool things like that. Um, she's inspired an awful lot of young girls to go in STEM. She even has a Barbie doll named after her. So who better to steal the identity of? So this is probably one of those slides you want to take a picture of. This is everything you need. So as I already said, I've got my... <laughs> It's fine, I'll carry on talking. I've got my work laptop set up and that already had everything apart from the face swap app and the Google Image Scraper on it. I don't, as a rule, use Google Image Scrape because in business I'm not allowed to, but for educational purposes I did this. So you've got a standard Ubuntu 16 setup with Git, Docker and NVIDIA Docker. They can be a bit fiddly to set up. Um, follow the guidelines on those blog posts and if you get stuck, use Stack Overflow, that's what it's for. Um, the two at the bottom, Audacity is an audio recording free software and Shotcut is also open source free video editing software. All out of the box. So, and I've given you the links because in like two seconds you could find the face swap app. It's just Google deep fakes and it's like the third, the third hit or something like that. So I've already talked about the hardware. I've got an NVIDIA 1050. It's not the most powerful card in the world. Um, just as a point, when you do Google for repos, please do eyeball them before you install them. 
you guys are probably all right, but I find if I don't say that, I've been to conferences with data scientists and AI people who will just download and install anything. These are the sort of people who see a code snippet on Stack Overflow and will just run it without understanding what it does. So please, if you download something that's going to do an install and a setup, eyeball it first. So the FaceSwap app comes with some pretty simple and straightforward instructions. It comes with a pre-created Docker container, so you don't have to fiddle around with installing TensorFlow and all the other things. So as long as you've got the NVIDIA libraries and CUDA set up and the NVIDIA Docker, you're pretty much good to go. So you download it, it takes about 10 minutes to build a container. You then have to give that permissions to export from the container to your, um, your local GUI, which again, it tells you the command to run. And then you run a further command that mounts a local drive on your laptop to the Docker container so that you can easily pass in data backwards and forwards. It doesn't matter if the container crashes. That is the only fiddly bit, because if you get that wrong, it will not give you an error message. It will just work, and then you won't have access to any of your data. Nothing will run. And if you don't know in detail how Docker and Linux file system mounting works, it can be a nightmare to debug. So, 10 minutes in, well, five minutes of hands-on time and 10 minutes in, I've got this. It's that easy. Someone's written a GUI for it, which is really good. And it's got a whole load of options, which I'm not going to go into, because you don't need them. So you can see across the top, you've got extract, train, convert, and extra tools. So step one, as we saw on my previous slide, extract. We need to give it data. And you'll see input directory, output directory, alignment file. You hover over all of these, it tells you exactly what it is looking for. So after 15 minutes, we're ready to start. So source data. Samantha Cristoforetti is quite famous. There is a lot of images of her, although a lot of them are quite similar. Um, I did a Google scrape. I put in quite a few different search terms to try and get images of her from before she was on the ISS, afterwards, and while she was on there, all of the interviews, um, to really try and get as much as I could. Um, initially, I got about 700 images. I then went through and said, OK, well, these images are identical. These images are not her. They just happen to have been on a web page that mentions her. And these images have got several people in. So I cropped the faces out. And I was left with about 470 images just of her. Some were tight to the face, some were quite big. And this took about 30 minutes. So now we're 35 minutes hands on, 10 minutes grabbing coffee. I am not as famous. So I couldn't just grab a whole load of images from myself. I didn't even have enough images um, lying around on my laptop. So what I did, I got my camera, and I wandered around the house like an idiot doing this, getting lots of different lighting sources, pulling faces so that I was doing all this sort of speaking. My daughter thought this was hilarious. But, and I wasn't desperately trying to make sure that my face was centered. I wanted to get all of the angles. So I was just wandering around doing this. I went outside, inside. And I got two minutes worth of HD footage. Now, the face swap app can deal with both still images and video and both. It's really easy. I mean, you can see what I've put in. I put in my video at the top. I've given it an output directory. I've not specified an alignments file. And what it's doing, for my video, it immediately exported all the frames. So I just had a whole load of still images. And then the process is identical. It's going through, and for every image, it's finding a face. For each face, it's trying to find the interesting features of that face to understand what makes up that face, what makes me look like me. And this is about five minutes. There's five minutes of the video, it's about the same for, for doing Sam. And behind the scenes, FaceSwap is using VGG faces. Again, free software. It's created by the Visual Geometry Group from the University of Oxford, which is where the VGG comes from. And they initially created this to try and determine whether an image was of a celebrity, and if so, which one it was, and the differences between celebrities. And this is from the paper, which I've just listed at the bottom. And they've got 
um, correct classifications, um, correct negatives, and incorrect classifications. So what they were looking at, once they'd established the facial features, was what was the difference between the facial features in image one and image two. And if it was the same person, there should be a huge overlap in those facial features. And it doesn't get it right all the time, but it gets it right most enough. And this, possibly not that readable, that says softmax at the bottom, that is the AI architecture. If you want to go away and recreate it, the paper tells you exactly how to do that. You can create your own because it's open source. The face swap app includes all of this code and the pre-trained model for free. You don't have to worry about it. This is why the pace is advancing so quickly. You don't need to create these tools anymore. It's just there. When I started, you'd get the paper and you'd have to implement the algorithms yourself. It's all on GitHub now. You can just find it. And this is the output. This is one of my frames. I picked one when I was actually smiling. And the alignments file for that particular frame creates a whole load of XY coordinates, which map my face. So you can see they're mapping my jaw, my mouth, my eyes, my eyebrows, and the direction of my nose. What you should notice here is that it's not mapping anything above my eyebrows. My forehead and hair are irrelevant. It also has no knowledge of glasses. If you wear glasses, it will make a mess. You can see it's not quite got the edge of my head right because my head moves in quite a lot because I am extremely short-sighted and it can't cope with that very well. And I know this because I work with visual data, but I still did it with glasses on because I wanted to see what was going on. So we now have 470 images of Sam, all with these sorts of alignment files, and about 3,000 images of me, all with these alignment files. So we then plug that into FaceSwap. And this is what we're getting. So you can see at the top, it tells you what's my input and my alignment file for A, my input and my alignment file for B. I've not changed any of the other settings. I've just ran this out of the box. And it's slightly cut off at the bottom. So this is 300 iterations in. And what it's doing is if you look at, I don't think I've got a laser pointer, but if you look at, <coughs> so the first column, it's taking a genuine image of Sam. In the column next to it, it's trying to turn that into another version of Sam. And the column next to that is trying to turn it into a version of me. And it's doing that for three and six columns. And then the second half is it's taking a genuine picture of me and trying to turn it into Sam. And you can see really early on, there's basically a big blurry square where the face should be. But if you kind of squint at it, you can almost see, um, particularly in the very top uh, left corner, that third face is starting to get my eye shape. So this was, you know, sort of a few minutes in, I sat and watched it because I had nothing better to do. And I thought, that's going great. I'm just going to leave that and go and see, do something else, watch some TV. So let's assume that that's processing. So what is it doing under the hood? It's using GANs. GANs are great. It's two competing neural networks. The first network takes random noise. It doesn't necessarily have to be random noise and learns to create a face shape from that random noise. And that's the generator. The second one is the discriminator, which learns to tell the difference between real images and generated images. And in the beginning, it's really easy because the real images are nice and sharp and the generated images are all fuzzy. If the generator creates something believable and the discriminator doesn't catch it, that then reinforces the generator. If the discriminator gets it right, can distinguish between the fakes and the real images, it reinforces the discriminator. So these two networks over time are both getting better based on each other. If you want to implement your own, there's a really nice blog that tells you how to do it from scratch. Again, you don't need to, you can just download all these things. You do not need a PhD in any sort of mathematics or AI to do this. This is probably GCSE computer science level stuff. I think the most complicated thing in all of this is getting the NVIDIA Docker containers set up.
this is a really important point. Um, this will kill your machine. It will take 100% CPU and 100% GPU and all of your RAM and lots of swap and your fans will be running at 5,000 RPM and the whole thing will be horrendous. So I left, I'd left it and I'd gone off and it was Saturday, I was probably watching the Grand Prix qualifying and I came back and I noticed that the time on the clock hadn't updated and I touched my laptop and it was really hot. And the whole thing had frozen. It had got to the point where it just shut down everything because computers are really good these days at doing that. But had there been anything flammable nearby, um, it wouldn't have been good. Um, I had to do a full on hard reboot. I had to leave it for a little bit. I even put it in the fridge for a few minutes just to... <laughs> <laughs> I had a spare shelf just to really try to cool it down. And then... When I got it to the point where it felt safe enough to turn it back on again, and I was worried that maybe I'd completely bricked my work laptop, turned it back on, it was absolutely fine. Because we'd mapped the container to a local drive and it was saving as it went along, I'd lost about an hour's worth of data. It's not a huge amount in the scheme of things. So I, had to, I went through, I verified that the data was okay, restarted the app, um, realized that I couldn't restart the app because um, the way that Docker mounts things was it still had a kind of ghost mount and it wouldn't remount everything. So I just had to kill off the containers, rebuild them, remount everything, um, and then it all came up. I hit go and it realized that it had already been running for I think an hour and a half and it was fine and just carried on. So it didn't restart, which was great. So once I was happy that everything was working, I got my extra cooling pad that I have for my laptop out and put it out, made sure that there was definitely nothing flammable around it and that the smoke alarms were working and left it for a day. It was, it was a little bit nervous sleeping overnight with that going, but it's fine. So it ran for about um, 20 hours. So I'd maybe another 15 minutes of hands-on effort just to get it going again, which you wouldn't necessarily need to do, and then 20 hours of, of running. And then we got this. I could have let it run for a lot longer. It's still not perfect. But that third column is actually pretty good. That's definitely me. It's a bit freaky, but it's me. It's me, sometimes with, sometimes without glasses, because glasses cause all sorts of problems. Um, but particularly the, uh, one, two, three, yeah, the very middle row. The hair's not right, but it's me, which is quite strange. Going from me to Sam, um, still looks rubbish. I don't care about that because I don't want to create a deep fake of a really famous astronaut presenting an AI talk. Um, <laughs> who would want to do that? So I only want to put me somewhere exciting. So I've got a model. So you see from the timing, about an hour of hands-on time, 22 hours of processing. Really not a lot. So then I want to find, what do I want to do with this model? So this is an interview from December 2014. Um, it's an interview with the BBC. It's about half an hour long. There's a lot of dull bits in, but you can see Sam's clearly on the ISS. She is floating. Um, is this? Let me have a look. So using a browser extension, I just downloaded this from YouTube. And then using the Shotcut app, which I mentioned earlier, I just cut out what I felt was about the most interesting um, portion of it. Well, I can ah, think of uh, simple things like, uh, for example, right now we, we don't have. So she's talking about communication. You can see the microphone's floating. It's definitely in space. It's not just someone putting a screen up behind. Um, she's even wearing a similar watch. Great. Um, the hair's not right, but I could always fix that by cutting my own. We say we are in lots of signals, so we lose communication. Now, so one next because step um, um, another next step would be to, to make it easier uh, on board, for example, having uh, wireless headsets. Uh, well, now most of the time we use uh, headsets that are or microphones that are connected via a long cable. Right, stopped. So. Um, you can see that she's in space, she's floating, she's talking quite quickly, she has a lot of Italian inflections, um, which might be a problem, but why not, let's give it a go. 
and I got this. This is me in space. Um, it's not perfect. Like I said, I didn't run the model long enough. Um, my glasses are a problem. But it's my face floating in space, which is really cool. This was just using the Convert app. All I had to do for that, um, sadly I haven't got a screenshot, I just pointed it at the model that I'd created in the previous step and this video. And what it does is the same as when it's doing the training step. It took the video, took every single frame, did the conversion. So I then had a directory full of pictures of me. Um, it provides an FFmpeg tool, so you can stitch it all back together. That's in the tool section, again, button. And it created a video of my choice, which looks like me, but sounds like Sam. So I then had to fix that. And this is the Shotcut app. So the blue line is the original video and audio. I just hit the mute button. It's not that difficult to do. I then used, um, I wrote down what she was saying. I used Audacity to try and say the same thing and tweaked it a little bit just to try and get the timing right because obviously she doesn't speak like a natural English speaker. How she phrases things and where she puts inflections aren't quite the same as I would. And it caused much hilarity in my house when I was doing this because apparently the first time I was listening to her and trying to say the same things, but I ended up doing a really bad English-Italian impression. <laughs> so the final version that I used wasn't, it isn't as good as a professional audio person could make it. So if I was doing this properly, rather than this is the absolute basics, I'd record it in sections. You can use Audacity and Shotcut to stretch um, what's being said to fit the mouth movements. So as you'll see when I show you the final product, it's not great in places because I did the audio twice and then I, I just got bored. So, all right, this is me. I'm just going to drop the lights. Um, there we go. So this, and if you saw on the previous slide, this was created in about an hour and a half of hands-on time and 22 and a half hours of processing. So someone with nothing else to do over a weekend could create something of this quality. If you wanted to do it better, I'll talk about some of the things that go wrong with this in a minute. Well, I think there's things like, right now, we... There's there's been been on board in terms of satellites sometimes. Our antennas are just not be able or not able to pick up the satellite for a few minutes, sometimes even 10 or 15 minutes. So we for that period of time we say we are in loss of signal. Yeah the audio goes quite bad there. One next step would be to have continuous coverage. Another next step could be to, to make it on board for example having wireless headsets when now most of the time we use headsets Right, so there's a lot of things wrong with that, but that is what you can do out of the box with no effort. <laughs> I am not a visual effects artist. I, I have no idea how to use audio software. That was just free tools, hour and a half of my time, and a weekend when I was reading books, watching the Grand Prix, and doing a whole load of other things. So. What is wrong with that? So firstly, as I mentioned about the audio, I'm not syncing up. Her lip movements are not the same as mine when she's speaking English. That's easy to fix. Um, the timing is easy to fix. You may have noticed, if you're looking closely around my glasses, I get a double eyebrow thing going on. That's because the software can't tell the difference between the top of my glasses and where my eyebrows are. So particularly when Sam's raising um, her eyebrows and being quite expressive, I end up with my glasses, my own eyebrows, and an extra one. <laughs> Easy to fix. Again, if, I, if I'd have re-recorded that without my glasses, I could have got a much better result. If I'd have left it running for a week, I'd have got a much better result. It would have been a lot sharper. But that's a weekend's worth of work. It's that easy. Thousand pound worth computer, free software, no knowledge. You don't need to understand AI or any of the background to do that. So back to the dystopia. It's really easy. That's what I'm going to tell you. Um, a lot of people are getting pretty blasé about this. It's celebrities. It's the celebrities that they're making porn of. We don't really care about that. Um, I'd like to, you all to think a little bit deeper. 
It's already been used to create inappropriate videos. It's already been used to create political videos. You might have seen the, did Obama really say that one? I suspect there's already real propaganda leaking into our media, leaking onto YouTube and Facebook. Um, Pornhub and the Zao app and various others are already implementing ways to detect celebrity faces. But what about me? What about you? What about those of us that aren't in the public eye, that are not being protected? What happens when we're the victims? Would we even know? Unless you're a frequenter of these sites, you may not never know. What happens if someone wants to take down a CEO or an MP by creating a video of them doing something that maybe it was suspected they did, but showing proof, maybe being abusive or racist? It won't matter that it was faked. It's the perception. What happens if someone shows you a video of your partner being unfaithful? Of course they're going to deny it. What do you believe? What happens if the person you're up in court claiming attacked you and mugged you has video evidence of them eating in a restaurant from a CCTV camera? This is the world that we are rapidly approaching. So how can we detect these fakes? This is the important stuff. Blockchain's the answer to everything. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> there are an awful lot of people suggesting that blockchain is the answer to this. Um, it might be, no one's quite figured out the details yet. Um, and even if it is, who is going to set up um, the ledger? Who is going to be the one responsible for deciding what is fake, what is genuinely edited, and what has been inappropriately edited? Given accusations of bias and everyone's natural distrust, it's probably not the solution. So let's look at um, other solutions. Blink detection. Um, this is rapidly becoming less of a good means of detecting deepfakes. The reason that this worked was a lot of the source material for deepfakes was pictures of celebrities smiling and going about their day-to-day -day business. Very rarely will you get a picture of a person with their eyes shut. So as a result, the model does not learn to blink. Now in mine, it kind of blinked a little bit because we were going from a video with someone blinking which was my source video, to a video with someone blinking. So it was, I wasn't fully shutting my eyes, but you could see the movements. However, for a lot of the ones generated without much thought, this is an easy way to detect. But again, the models are getting better. Another very good way of detecting, um, and for some reason Nicolas Cage is the go-to face to put on everything, um, you can detect them by looking for things that the human eye can't see. So when you are just replacing a section of the face, there will be aberrations in the frames, in the individual videos, where it's joined the original face to the new face. You might not be able to see these, but a computer can. And it can detect these, and it can detect these very reliably. However, this is just generating a tertiary GAN. As soon as these become available, the, to create the deep fakes, they'll just plug this in as a second level of discriminator and make the fakes better. As they get better and you can have better graphics cards, you can replace a wider section of the image. So at some point, it might be the whole head. And therefore, how do you tell where the join is when it just might be background? How can you tell the difference between a fake and something that's been legitimately edited or green screened? So maybe a combination of those techniques could work. The most promising thing is recent, and you can tell from the archive link, this was June this year, is adding noise, noise that humans can't see, that will completely fool the ability of the face detection. So stop it at the source. So at the top, you have the original image that's got the, the face bounding box that's been detected. At the bottom, you have got noise, and it said it's been amplified 30 times so we can actually see it. And then in the middle, you've got the effect of adding that noise to the images, and you can see it can't detect the face anymore. This is the most promising way we currently have of detecting, or rather preventing fakes. We could add this 
to our still images before we upload them to Facebook. We could add this sort of thing to all of our movies and it would cause a temporary block. But people will get faster because this is now open source. So as soon as the knowledge to do this is out there, there will be people, because as we heard this morning, people are awful, um, there will be people working out how to get past this. So I just to conclude there, perhaps not fully reject everything you see or hear, but please have a healthy criticism and cynicism of what you see, particularly if you're given something that's leaked, that is designed to make you change your mind. Do not always believe what you see and hear in isolation. Thank you very much. Wow, well, I'll never look at my, my own face the same way. <laughs> Any questions for Janet? You can always grab her afterwards. It's fine, yeah, they're all rushing off to go create their own. <laughs> oh. Uh, it might be worth just shouting it's such a hard thing. So I, I'm guessing the reason deep fakes work so well is because we're, as humans, really good at detecting faces and merging together faces in a way that falls apart when they're inverted and things like that. I mean, do deep fakes work with non-face stimuli? Um, as long, yeah, as long as you are detecting what you want to swap and you're swapping like for like, absolutely. Um, you need to change the code because obviously this app is completely designed for faces, it's tuned for faces. If you want to do something else, so you want to swap you know, dog faces or cans of Coke for cans of Pepsi, you can absolutely do that. You just need to tweak what's going on behind the scenes. Cool. Yep. Have you got any real life examples of, of cases that have been discovered recently? Um, of, of bad things, no. Um, but there's been a lot where I think it's been done as a look this could happen, but nothing that has been outed as bad, apart from the whole porn issue, which is well known. There's, there's a whole load of that, but not that has been found, but I, I believe that there are some out there. And the main reason that um, they've probably not been found is because they've got too many grains of truth in them for people to look. It's really easy if you've got something that, that everyone believes happened anyway, and you know that people were in the same place at the same time, and you just kind of create something that, you know, it was a, someone caught something on video, it'll just get believed. And if the major news agencies don't pick it up, we might not never know about it, but it's the sort of thing that would go into the echo chambers of Facebook groups and, and stay there forever. Oh, no. <laughs> Just thinking further up down the road, suppose there are some big scandals that come out through deep fakes that become you know, really popular. Have you got any comments on a strategy that we can use to help sort of deprogram ourselves and to remain more sceptical of that so we don't get sucked into it? Um, only the, the poster that I showed at the beginning. Um, we need to start thinking more critically about what we're presented with. It's really, really easy if we're presented with something that we agree with to just accept it. Yet, if, oh, I don't know, it's really hard to come up with examples, but I'm going to try to give one that will hopefully resonate universally. Um, I think everyone in this room is probably anti-Trump, but um, if it suddenly came out that on the side he'd been donating vast amounts of his wealth, and that's why he didn't want to release his tax returns to, I don't know, some charity somewhere, we'd probably look at that more critically than the people who are Trump supporters, just because it's against our view. We need to apply that to everything and just and stop that self-reinforcement. And it's really hard because we are genetically programmed to do that. It's, but we have to. And we have to teach, I mean, as Andy was talking this morning, we have to start, we have to teach our children about rational debate and logical fallacies and how to think critically about things. And that's more important than maths. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, Janet will be around. Do you yep, stay? Yeah, I'm, I'm here afternoon? for the rest of the day. So you can always catch her afterwards.